Terry has breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. So she fits into this extremely rare case that the FDA and surgeons have mentioned. Terry is just one of 10 in our Facebook group for ALCL women that are currently diagnosed. The group has not even 100 members and 10 of them have ALCL. It's become really close to my heart because I've met them and I get frustrated and I get frustrated by the lack of knowledge that's out there and I get uh, frustrated by the lack of informed consent and what Dr. Um, Clemens didn't mention, he had it on a webinar that's no longer available, is he informally polled 500 plastic surgeons um, and he still practices as a plastic surgeon but um, one third to two thirds of those plastic surgeons do not discuss ALCL with their patients prior to surgery. So that to me is, is just not acceptable. I can honestly say that I have cried for Terry many, many times. <laughs> I'm gonna cry now. I have prayed for her. I've asked for the whole groups to lift her up in prayer. Um, I think that her story needs to be told. I want her to beat these odds that she has against her because she has huge odds against her. And I want everybody to listen and I want everybody to tell her story. Every woman that undergoes breast augmentation should have to hear her story. So I want to tell you thank you. From the bottom of my heart, she came all the way from Canada just to be here and talk to y'all. So I'm going to welcome Terry and I'm sorry I'm crying, but it's, um, I'm just grateful for her and I'm grateful she made it here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? Some days are good, some days aren't. And I was sitting at lunch and meeting some new lovely people, right? And so they're, you know, we, you know, obviously we're talking about breast implants, and it's like, what do you have? And I'm like, oh, I have cancer, and oh, I have stage four anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and I forget what a what a showstopper that is, right? It's a conversation stopper, and I was like, oh yeah, don't don't forget about that. Um, and I say that because I'm I'm not here for sympathy. I registered to come to the conference. And then a little while later, uh, Jane, which was a, about a, me flexing my independence that I could do this, and then Jamie asked me to speak, so I certainly did not come here. But what I do know is I sit uh, in a room with, with a lot of people who have empathy, because there's a lot of sick women in this room. You either have been sick, you are sick, or you know somebody who's sick. And uh, there's a lot of men in this room, because I, I know that I don't walk this alone. <laughs> if I just don't talk about my family, it would be okay. Right? <laughs> So uh, I walked into my plastic surgeon's office in uh, 2008. I'm in construction. Well, I was. I'm, I'm unemployable now. But uh, one of the only unique things about me was that I own a construction company, and uh, specifically a paving company. So I work like a crazy woman from the moment that the frost is out of the ground uh, until November. So I went to see a plastic surgeon in December who was referred to me from an, a friend of mine who's a cosmetic surgeon. And uh, he told me I was, I was textbook. I'd been thinking about implants for a long time. I did not do this because I had self-esteem issues. Vanity issues, maybe. Not, I haven't looked up the word vanity. Somebody mentioned it yesterday, and I think I need to look up the word vanity. Um, but my story is not unique, and, and I think that's probably what's important about my story is that I'm not special. You know, I'm, I was uh, in my early 40s. I have two sons. I just simply had you know what I call post baby boobs and add some aging to it and I had surgery because I could you know I had the money I did the research I thought I did the research let me say today um, what I know today is when I google breast implants or breast implant surgery um, what I didn't realize at the time when I in hindsight right when I look back is so much of what I was reading I never looked at the source so much of the research that I looked at today, I know, was driven by the industry and by plastic surgeons or cosmetic surgeons. I, I, I don't know what word to use. Um, but I didn't realize that those websites all look really medical and they present very professional. And I, didn't, I, didn't, I never looked at the source until after I got sick. Uh, so he told me I was textbook. And uh, the, I will tell you, I, I can only talk, speak to you from my experience. I'm not an expert, I'm not an MD, I, I don't have a Bachelor of Science, I have a Bachelor of Commerce. I know all about money, that's what, what I learned in school. Um, 
And the only risks that I was told were ones that, and, and I can, I remember him saying to me, it's the same as any surgery where you're going to go under general anesthetic. And general anesthetic and surgery comes with a certain degree of risk. I uh, had one friend who had implants. She loved it. She sort of went through a midlife crisis, lost a ton of weight, got implants, and she had a new life. And so she was, you know, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I was raised British, right? So, and, and I'm Canadian, so we're quite, uh, we're, we're quite, we're not very demonstrative. And uh, I remember she, she lifted her shirt, and I was like, whoa, whoa. I, I mean, anyway, I've never done that. Um, I told nobody I was having my surgery. I didn't even tell my mom. This was very private. I had it done in the winter. I had a girlfriend pick me up and drop me off. And uh, this was supposed to be, I did it for me. I was single at the time and I didn't do it for any other reason other than I could. And certainly the popularity of this, this procedure, I don't know, I'm, I'm not necessarily a lemming in life, but I, I think part of, the pop, part of my a uh, sense of safety or security is the level of popularity. And that's certainly before the statistics today where explant is now, what, number 10? Number 10, yeah, it, I, it wasn't like that in 2009. Um, I'm not here to bash any manufacturer, but I can only speak from my experience and, and what I had. So I had Allergan Natural Silicone Textured Implants. Uh, I left my surgeon's office, um, you know, my post-op, and I was given, this is uh, the Allergan Canadian device registration. And uh, I spent a long time in the fleet business doing leasing. And, and so there's a, there's a fine print at the bottom that says that, you know, please keep your contact information updated so that for safety, effect, efficacy, that word I can't say. Cause, thank you. Um, that please keep us in contact because we're going to let you know if something's different or wrong with your implant. And I'd spent a long time in the fleet business, so like that just sounded like an auto recall to me. So I thought, okay, as long as I keep my address uh, updated with Allergan, I'll be fine. Uh, they told me to carry around a wallet card. You know, it's kind of like wearing clean underwear in case you're in an accident, have clean underwear on and have your breast implant wallet card. Uh, when I went to see my when I went to see my surgeon, uh, the only thing I did say to him is because I'm in construction and I uh, in a small town of 50,000 people. So uh, I wear t-shirts, I wear high vis, I do a lot of traffic control, and the only thing I asked him was, I'm just looking to get my B cups back. I'm not looking to be bigger, I'm not looking to be the talk of the town on every dump trucks two-way radio that says, uh, hey, have you seen, uh, seen that, that Trapper City paving girl? She, you know, anyway, so that's all I asked for, was if you could just fill out my molded bra. And uh, he did tell me that I needed to be a little bit bigger because I was gonna age and I didn't know that Anyway, I was going to go through this aging process and for some reason, so I, I simply said to him, I own a business, right? So when a customer tells me to make their water go uphill, I say, that won't happen. And so I said, you're the expert, so you tell, you know, I'll, you tell me what I need. So he gave me some aging reasons why I should go a little bit bigger than sort of what my, what my molded bra had, had represented. Um, I, we were talking about this last night at dinner. You know, I had a honeymoon phase with my breast implants for the first couple of years. I really loved them. I loved the way they looked. And uh, one of the questions I get asked the most often, and it makes me so sad to say I had no symptoms. Um, I had no symptoms. I wish I could tell you I had symptoms because then other women would maybe know what to look for. And in Canada, we have national health care. And so when you turn, uh, when you turn 50, part of our national health care system, if you have no history of breast uh, cancer in your family, once you turn 50, you go through a, kind of a, a few pre-screening for cancer. And one of the things that I had done was a mammogram uh, to celebrate turning 50. And so I had a mammogram, which is a routine mammogram. I know today if I read Allergan's pamphlet, it says I'm supposed to have a diagnostic mammogram. I still haven't, no, I, I've never looked up what the difference is. Um, coincidentally, 10 days later, I hugged my husband and uh, I had, uh, I sort of jumped back. The mammogram, uh, they couldn't move my left implants. So those of us who have ever had mammograms, you know, they, mine were under the muscles, so they push your implant back to try and get the film. And uh, that's uncomfortable, but you know, I, I know lots of women have mammograms. Everyone says it's uncomfortable. So uh, when they they brought in another technician, and so they're sort of pushing me and squeezing me and, and 
you know, take the picture quickly. And, and so there was, you know, some pain involved, but I thought, well, okay, I heard they hurt. Uh, 10 days later, I have some marble like lumps under my sort of on the left side. And, uh, you know, at this age, there's no coincidences in life. You know, when I was young, I thought there was coincidences. There isn't. I called my family doctor. She said, your mammogram's perfect. So I thought, okay, must be the implant. And uh, I called my plastic surgeon. He, I went to see him. He sent me for an MRI. Um, my MRI follow-up, he told me that I had an extra X, the, the uh, implant had ruptured an extra capsular. Um, I never asked for him to read my MRI reports. You know, I'm just, I'm a lay person and today I have lots of medical reports, but I didn't know that in those days. What I know today is that my, uh, when you read the MRI report, uh, yes, I had an extra, extra cap. It was on the outside. I had uh, two lymph nodes that were lit up on the left side, and I had an intracapsular rupture on the right-hand side. And um, anyway, I had called the office to to make my first appointment to say I'd had these lumps, and God bless receptionists who aren't trained well. And uh, his receptionist said, oh, Oh, a mammogram? Oh, they rupture them all the time. And uh, sh and I remember thinking, oh, man, if I was your boss, you'd be in so much trouble for saying <laughs> that. <laughs> um, and and that, that was sort of my first impression was that mammograms rupture implants and ruptures happen all the time. And so I'm just, I just kind of went with the wave, to be honest with you. Um, I was scheduled for replacement surgery. So I've kept quiet about my story, except for a few women on Facebook, and uh, I don't talk about this. People don't know. They know I have cancer, obviously, because I got bald for a while, but um, so I'm, man, this is getting personal. It's all this, try not to blush. So by the time I went in for, uh, this is my pre-op before I went in for surgery, and so um, because I had this rupture, capsular constrictor had started on my left side. Um, I, I don't expect that maybe if your eyes are as bad as mine, you can't read this, but I've had some women ask me to send them my actual diagnosis because they have doctors or medical professionals that don't believe that there is a diagnosis called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. I'll leave that because I'm pretty sure in this crowd we were clear. Um, I, uh, I was driving in my truck headed to go see my crew and I got a call from um, from the, lymph the oncology department at the hospital where I'd had my explant surgery. And uh, unfortunately, they called to make an appointment and preempted the fact my plastic surgeon, ha surgeon hadn't told me about my diagnosis yet. Uh, um, this is rare. We, we've heard that today. Um, my surgery was done in a hospital, not at his, uh, at his cosmetic clinic where I'd had my implant implants put in. Um, in Canada, and I, I don't know if this is the same, but in Canada, anything that's taken out of the body is sent for pathology. And so my capsule was sent for pathology, and that's where the diagnosis was made. So yeah, I hope you have a, a, a firm stomach. Uh, the, my, my plastic surgeon was kind enough to give me these. Um, that's the uh, the gel that uh, the gel is in the bowl, and so is the so is the capsule. So my uh, my specific capsule had uh, th three tumors on it um, in anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Thank goodness the majority of women are are diagnosed out of the fluid, and um, that's a great if you've got to have this disease, that's the right diagnosis to have. Uh, unfortunately, there's the other minority of us, which is called the mass, and so that's what I had was tumors actually on the capsule. And uh, just because it gets better and better, this is a picture of the capsule inside out. I think what's important to know is that my plastic surgeon, uh, when I went to see him on follow-up uh, three days after, you know, I went to see him three days post-op, I still have my drains in, and um, and I'd, I'd got the call. He didn't take my drains out uh, yet because I was there's was too much fluid. But what I wanted to tell you is that he had never seen it before. So he kind of hemmed and hawed before the uh, pathology report had come back. And he said, you know, 
there was kind of it was kind of odd. That was that was the word he used. It was kind of like calcification, but it wasn't really cal calcification. Um, so the fact is, you know, he'd never seen it before, which I'm not surprised. When I went into his office uh, three days after, as I mentioned, uh, for my to get my drains out, and it was decided that we wouldn't do that. He um, he asked me to sign a release form. I, this is the part that I've taken out, but it's important to know that it says that I I was asked to sign this so that he could get his warranty uh, money back from from Allergan. It was a product claim form. I'm you know I, I didn't have my glasses on at the time, and so I said to him, I said like, you want me to sign what? And he said. I said, I can't really read it because I don't have my glasses on, and, and God bless him. He said, you know what, you really need to read this, so just take it home with you. And um, I don't know, there was something, there's something in the unspoken that, uh, that I took at home. And when I read this, I thought, I don't, this is far long before I was diagnosed, um, but all I knew is that if I walked in and I still had drains hanging from my chest, there was something odd about asking me to sign so that I would uh, release and forever discharge Allergan Inc. and any related persons and entities. And I just thought, gosh, that seems like an odd time when you're still, if, if any of us, well, surgery of any kind, right? So three days later, I was still in pretty rough shape. After my diagnosis came back, uh, the next stage obviously was to explant. Um, I ha it was three weeks between my so-called replacement surgery and my explant surgery. And in three weeks, uh, it was kind of three weeks from hell, excuse my language. Um, by the time I went in for surgery, I had capsular constrictor starting again on, on the left side. Um, I had taken to wearing men's shirts at work because I, um, my incisions wouldn't heal. Obviously, my body was not happy with this, and uh, I had infection leaking from my incision, uh, but I needed to go to work, so I had MacGyvered bandages all over my chest to collect the infection and then wore men's shirts at work so I could carry on with you know what I thought was important. This is my uh, explant surgery post-op in July. Um, you know, like anything, right, there's a grieving process when you're, I don't know, it's, it wasn't a grieving process for my implants, but there was definitely a grieving process because, you know, tied to our femininity and, uh, and, and being self-conscious now. I didn't have self-esteem issues about it before, but I obviously became very self-conscious. I don't know how long it took me before I would let my husband see me naked. Um, for, for those people who haven't explanted, if, if you're in the audience, um, it does get better. These are, these are probably, that picture is probably taken maybe a month, maybe two months after. The breast tissue does. Today, I don't, they don't look the same. They do fluff up, I think is the word that we use on, on the Facebook groups. So I just don't want to scare anyone from explant that it does, your tissues do heal amazingly. So now I just kind of have two that are different sizes. It's not nearly as uh, deformed looking as it as it was. Uh, some, there's some gratitude moments, right, where you like I truly believe there's some higher power intervention in your life. And um, my my uh, plastic surgeon, obviously, I now have a cancer diagnosis, so I'm referred to a lymph lymphoma oncologist, and she happened to do her fellowship at um, Princess Margaret in, is in Toronto. They they claim to be you know in the top five in the world and so she said because of the rarity of this diagnosis we're just going to get you right out of this hospital and we're going to we're going to push you over to the best and uh, the best that we have in in the area i had a pet scan um and th that's when the pet scan had lit up that uh not only did i have uh, left breast involvement and lymph node involvement but that the lymph nodes um in my left abdomen had also lit up and there was a, a, a mass on my small bowel or small intestine, whatever word you want to use. And um, yeah, so this is way more than I bargained for. Uh, they did a biopsy. So people kind of asked me what the testing was, right? The PET scan sort of you know, lights up where your cancer is or abnormalities are. And they cannot do a biopsy on, on your small bowel because they'll put a hole in it. Uh, but they did do a biopsy uh, in the lymph node right beside the small bowel to confirm that my lymph node was the same anaplastic large cell lymphoma that uh, originated in my breast. And if you ever get to know this disease, one of the first things they find out is whether or not you're ALK negative, ALK negative or positive in addition to the CD30. And so I went through a whole whack of staging. Anyone who's been through, through cancer 
or has lived with somebody or, or supported somebody in cancer, and so my, my staging came back at stage four because it's above and below the diaphragm and it had affected uh, two organs. So I completed my staging in uh, September and uh, I, I, was, I was scheduled for chemo. I had to delay chemo because I had my first round of C. diff to just to add a little bit of complication and painful <laughs> confusion. And um, standard, standard lymphoma, I had, I had six rounds of CHOP or CHOIEP actually specifically and you know they test you as you go and they think things are working and then after six rounds of CHOP they, they said well things aren't going so well and things are growing not shrinking. So um, in September I, is, is sort of that moment where I knew, I knew that things weren't good and uh, I, knew, I didn't know anything what stage four meant but I knew that wasn't good. So I'm a very pra pragmatic person, right? So the next thing I did was go get my affairs in order. Um, I have two sons. And uh, I'm just a really overly responsible person, so that seemed like the next right thing to do. And uh, emotionally, it's, it's, it feels surreal, right? When somebody says you have stage four, it's very surreal, uh, especially because I'm, you know, I'm still standing upright. and. Um, by then I had uh, had met, Facebook met, I don't think when Mark Zuckerman invented Facebook to find your high school, you know, colleagues uh, that you'd lost touch with, you had no idea that, you know, Facebook book would help save lives. And um, so by then I had found the Facebook groups and, and man, oh man, the momentum, the momentum of when I joined to what they are today is, is something else. And, and my gratitude for the women who are advocates on that group. I don't have the strength, I don't have the energy, and uh, I don't know that today, <clears throat> I don't know that I have the voice, right? When you're sick, it's, being sick can become a full-time job, and um, so my gratitude. My uh, oncologist at Princess Margaret, you know, whenever I sort of give him my two cents, because he just loves that so much when I do that, um, you know, he likes to remind me that there's only 60 documents. There's 258 reported cases. Nine women have died reported, and uh, but there are only 60 that they've followed, sort of from stem to stern. And and so one of the things that's difficult is that there's not enough of us uh, to, to guinea pig or test and and to know our story medically. And um, uh, I was able to get a hold of Dr. Clemens. Uh, through Jamie, who got through to Raylene, and so Dr. Clemens spoke to me and asked, uh, asked me about a, a specific chemotherapy, and uh, I brought that out to my I, I brought that my WebMD over to my oncologist and uh, said, you know, what about brintuximab? And after the chop had failed, uh, it's not standard protocol, and um, I was given what's called refractory or second course line GDP. And the whole intent is to, you know, wipe. Uh, unfortunately, lymphoma is systemic. So the intent was that I would start this next chemotherapy that was going to be far more aggressive and uh, that they would wipe me out to the point that I would qualify for stem cell transplants. And uh, anyway, that second chemotherapy didn't work either. And uh, that's when I really got... That's when I really got active. I contacted Dr. Susan Turner who's in, in the UK, they're doing a lot of research. I'd, I'd, con I'd seen her through Facebook, through the PIP um, legal stuff that's happening in Europe, and she was, she was speaking somewhere, I, anyway. So they're doing, they're doing research over in the UK. I emailed her, and like, go figure, she emailed me back, and uh, you know, said brintuximab. I was able to contact Dr. Clemens through Jamie, through Raylene, and uh, you know this man picked up the phone and called me from his vacation, and um, and he, and he's the one who started talking to me about brintuximab. Luckily, I was able to get brintuximab through a clinical trial at Princess Margaret. And um, you know this is non-medical, but my oncologist, I have uh, my my lymphoma is actually in my pec muscle, and uh, and you know I um, I used to have a lump right here. So I just finished my uh, fourth round of brintuximab, and uh, you can barely see my lump, so it's working. Yeah. Um, 
but I guess because, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, right? You throw it up against the wall and see what sticks. So, um, so you know, now they're talking about stem cell transplants again, and, and that uh, terrifies me. And uh, But I, what I know is today now I have contact with Dr. Clemens and, and with Dr. Turner, and, and I'm able to email these doctors who have never met me. Um, so the bad news is I have this diagnosis. The good news is I have this diagnosis because I... I'm not really looking for attention. I'm certainly looking for some feedback from these folks. And uh, because of my diagnosis, they, they kindly get back to me with what their professional thoughts are. And um, anyway, that's my story. And here I am in July, in March, um, after my second, after my chemotherapy was not, was not working the second course, uh, they gave me four to six months to live. And, uh, I'm still standing upright, right? And, and so it's a bit surreal. And you know, another round of C diff and uh, and thrush and all. I, like I just, I have this life that I balance, you know, between infections, but gratitude, right? It's why I'm not here for sympathy, right? If you want to change your perspective, go, you know, hang out at Princess Margaret's, and uh, you know, this is my family. Well, not the girls, they're girlfriends, but uh, my two sons. Of course, I, I have I was, grew up with brothers and have sons, so I always had this lack of female energy in my life. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just know that I, I need to be able to look my sons, Max and Liam, in the face and say I, I tried everything I could. And whether, whether it works or not, um, I, I, feel, I feel great empathy for women who, um, you know, the first women who died from this. Um, you know, that diagnosis was barely invented or however they come up with a diagnosis. And so those women were very, very sick with lymphoma, v very sick. Um, you know, wheelchairs, oxygen, and horrific pain. And uh, their diagnosis on this disease didn't happen until they were at the, you know, nth, nth term of their life. So, so I am not grateful that I have stage four breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma but what I do know is that when I read some of your stories some of your stories are very sick women like very sick women and uh, I, I have a gratitude that my that my diagnosis is, is black and white right there's no we're not up for discussion anymore and uh, anyway I do I do wish that same more clear-cut diagnosis for for thousands and thousands of women that are suffering and um, Anyway, I think that's it. Thanks.